Hello everyone and welcome back to our weekly UETH workshop. Today we will be sharing some best practices on consumer safety for those navigating the crypto space, which is one of the most important topics to know about. Our session is titled Embedded Safety and the Future of Risk, and I'm really honored to have Micah Isagawa here, CEO of Webacy, joining us. I'm Tina Dai, I'm your host. I've been an investor over the last five years in early stage startups, and I've also been someone who's really heavily used crypto products. And I myself am very familiar with the challenges as well as the crucial need for safety in the blockchain space. So I'm excited to introduce you to Micah, who is a founder making blockchain security more understandable and accessible through Webacy. So Webacy is a security layer for self-custody. It provides a suite of services that is designed to help users navigate blockchain, as well as helping you make sure that your digital assets are safe now um, and going forward. So before we dive into the heart of our discussion, a few reminders. The first is if you have any questions, this session is recorded, but we will do our best to answer your questions asynchronously if you drop them in the Discord channel. Um, and of course, if you have a UETH chapter, please keep our Discord active and ask your questions and discuss whatever you learn from this workshop. So the entire goal of why we do these workshops is we want to showcase real world innovation um, that companies are building and developing on in this space. And our whole motto for these workshops and for you, Ethan, in general is learning by doing. So reflect on how you can contribute to different projects or maybe start your own projects using some of the insights you'll learn today from Webacy. So I'm going to now bring up Micah um, to the stage and we'll uh, get started with our workshop. Uh, it's really great to have you with us. Um, I'm going to ask you a few questions about your journey. Um, so Micah, I think, has one of the most like fascinating backgrounds out there. She's been um, in Cirque du Soleil. Mm -hmm. She's been an acrobat. She's obviously a techie at heart. Um, can you just tell us more about your life story and and how you went from, you know, being so deep in something so creative to now tech and being a founder in tech? Yeah, happy to. And thank you for having me, Tina. I'm super excited to be here. And I love the motto of learning by doing. I think my life is really reflective of that. And that really resonates a lot with me. So um, my background's kind of weird. As you mentioned, I went from everywhere from being an acrobat at Cirque du Soleil to doing computer science and school to now starting this company in crypto and security. And so if I were to summarize in a nutshell, um, my cultural background is very important to me. So I was born and raised in Japan. I also grew up in the Minnesota uh, in the United States. I'm half Japanese. And so I grew up really going back and forth. In school, I wanted to be an astrophysicist growing up. I was really into space and watching the, the crazy TV shows uh, on History Channel and Science Channel growing up, if you remember those. But ultimately, I went to Stanford um, straight out of high school to start studying, ended up getting an opportunity to work for the circus, essentially. I quote unquote ran away to join the circus. Uh, but during that time, I traveled the world. I worked for Cirque du Soleil's Totem. If you've ever seen Cirque du Soleil, there's a couple shows in Vegas and beyond. Uh, learned a lot. You know, the 18 year old first job out of high school is working for the circus. So a lot of personal growth. Came, came back to Stanford. I studied AI. I was learning about decision making under uncertain, uncertainty. So think about um, imperfect information games or self-driving cars, drones, things like that. And then got into security pretty quickly during my internships and also post-graduation. I was at Microsoft as a cybersecurity engineer with the government and then started Webacy in 2021. Amazing. Um, what led you down the crypto rabbit hole in the first place? And when did you first get familiar with crypto? I remember this really clearly. I first learned about blockchain and Bitcoin in 2014 while I was working for Cirque du Soleil. Uh, so the thing about Cirque is that it's a very physically demanding job, but you have a lot of mental time uh, because there's, there's a lot of working out and exercise and being there. But then when you're not actually performing or training, 
you're kind of free to do whatever you want. So there's a lot of learning going on across the board. And there, there were two particular coworkers that were a little bit nerdy, a little bit into computers, and they were talking about Bitcoin. And so that's when I was first introduced to it. And I was really blown away by a lot of the promise of what blockchain technology could potentially do to improve our systems as humans. And that's when I got hooked. Um, but then I got more and more into the tech when I went back to school and started studying computer science. Got it. And so um, it sounds like you went from uh, Stanford, then into Microsoft. Um, you were familiar with crypto in the background, but how? what is the origin story of WebSC? Like what inspired you to focus your career on, on um, blockchain security? There were a couple catalyst moments for me, but one of the bigger ones was something that unfortunately happens to a lot of people when they first enter web uh, when, when they first enter web three, and that was that I got hacked. Mm. Um, I've actually gotten hacked twice, which is super embarrassing to admit, but this is at the very beginning of my journey, um, and it was it was very simple. And for me, I like to think of myself as quite technical. Um, I have an engineering degree and I've built a bunch of things in the past. So the fact that I could so easily fall prey to the victim of these typical hacks and scams, it made me realize that crypto wasn't going to have mass adoption until a lot of these regular user experience issues were fixed. So in that sense, I wanted to fix it. There were at the time, no tools and services on the market to help me as a self-custodied user safely navigate the ecosystem. So I wanted to build them. So Webacy is going a lot from that from the day it was born, but that's where it was originally derived from. I think everybody has gotten scammed on some level in crypto. I too have been scammed, um, <laughs> which is unfortunate, but you know, which makes whatever you're building all the more useful. Um, I, actually, one more question um, that touches on this like idea of being a founder, right? And so a lot of our members are people who are either university students or people who have an interest in blockchain. Um, and it seems like you transitioned in your career pretty quickly into being a founder. So I'm curious, um, what what like gave you that conviction that you could just go pursue solving a problem that you found in the world? Yeah, this is a really great question. And I've, I've been talking about this with friends uh, a lot recently, ones that have started companies and ones that haven't. Uh, and for me, I think it was twofold. So the reason I started at Microsoft post-graduation was actually kind of a timing thing. I graduated during the pandemic mm -hmm. and uh, there were multiple offers, but I knew that Microsoft was going to be a safe choice in terms of offers getting rescinded from what I heard from people that were potentially starting at startups or starting to do other things. Uh, so just strategically, I thought that Microsoft would be a great experience for me out of college. Um, and then second, all of my work experience prior to that was actually working with founders directly at early stage companies. So in my core, I knew that that's what triggered me to really care about the work that I did every single day. Um, so in the back of my mind, I knew it's coming at some point. And then the, my, the moment I had the idea for Webacy, I couldn't stop thinking about it. And I was working on it every night and every weekend to the point where I wasn't really doing my job justice anymore. So I knew that that change needed to happen. Um, and the timing was right, too. It was 2021. Crypto was really big uh, and crypto continues to be growing ever since. Well, yeah, that's that's um, it's a really interesting answer, right? Because you basically found an idea that you were just motivated to pursue intrinsically and you never really had to question this idea of courage. Like, do you have the courage to be a founder because you just did it. Um, well, that's really cool. Thank you for sharing all this context. Um, I think this is a good time maybe to transition to your presentation. Um, so I will um, add your presentation to the stage and we will um, hear more about the best practices in terms of self-custody. Awesome. Let's do it. All right. So... To start off, uh, I think the security and safety are, it's one of those things that fundamentally all of us know it's important. Right? You know you should wear a helmet when you bike, you know you should wear a seatbelt when you drive. For the most part, people do, or they're required to by law to do so. Uh, but it's also one of those things that I have never understood why people don't find it super exciting. But then you think about it and you talk to people and you realize that there's, it, it's the last thing you want to think about because it's kind of one of those things that you fundamentally just expect to be taken care of for you. Especially if you think about the systems that have been put in place so far, rules are thought about so we're safe as humans. There's already locks on the doors that you're in. Banks and financial management institutions are built and regulated to keep your money safe already. So we've never really gone through the process of 
having to fend for ourselves when it comes to safety and security, especially within this new Web3 ecosystem. And so if you come from it from that angle, there's a lot of gap to fill and there's a lot to learn. Hence, all the hacks and scams that are happening right now, it's part of the growing pains of not thinking about that prior to diving in to all the exciting opportunities that crypto provides. So this slide, I think, does a really good job of encapsulating some of the scary parts of crypto and crypto security. If you're not already super hyped on safety like I am, maybe this slide will give you some numbers to make you care about it a little bit more. When we think about hacking, around $4 billion in US dollar of value was hacked in 2022. This was a really bad year for crypto hacks and scams. And there's a, a lot of distribution. I think I have some charts coming up that'll show where the hacks or where the hacks are coming from, what kind of hacks occurred, which gives a bit of a better breakdown. And last year, it was around $2 billion of hacks and scams. So it was reduced quite a bit. But I think that if in terms of billions, there's a lot of work to be done to actually reduce that even further. And then Q1 of this year already, we saw approaching a billion dollars in hacks and scams. And just the other day, there was another one. The week before, there's another one. So it's pretty clear that there's a lot of um, progress to be made when it comes to both platform security. Uh, but the reason why we're doing the session today is personal security. Make sure you're not a victim. So that panel is about showing the amount of hacks and scams that are still happening in the space. And this is kind of the barrier of mass adoption as well. If you think something's not safe, you're probably not going to touch it. Now, the next one next to it, the phishing with the arrow, there was around 100 million uh, in phishing scams drained in Q1 of 2024. So that's just in three months. And I want to point out that this is just from reported hacks and scams. Uh, and I think a lot of people, for the most part, don't want to admit if they're a victim of maybe accidentally clicking on a phishing link or making that mistake. And so this is probably significantly underreported. So if you think about it that way, there's a lot more happening here. Now, the market slide, if you are in Web3 at all, you saw the BT, uh, the Bitcoin ETF get approved a couple months ago uh, that had a lot of impacts on the market. And we see ETH ETF going through proposals right now too. Uh, but there's just a lot of inflow of crypto into the space. And if you've been tracking the markets, there's been a lot of volatility in the space following that. And so the, the interest is still here. And this is just to, stay, to say that crypto is here to stay. And there are a lot of opportunities come moving forward as long as we can build the infrastructure necessary to support that. Same thing, volume. We're seeing tons of volume on chain. I think Solana just had like a highest volume transaction day the other day. And so we're, we're seeing a lot of increase of usage on blockchain. So these slides, if you have, if you want to check it out, this is all of these images are from Chainalysis, the actual graphs. They do an annual report of hacking. It's really excellent. I would love to meet the team that puts these reports together. Uh, but if you want to check it out, this is from the 2023 report last year. So if you look, this is the visual that shows the trend in hacks and scams over the years. We saw that 2022 had a really big spike, uh, and then 2023 went down a little bit, but we're still seeing significant hacks in the space. Uh, this side's really cool. This is kind of the platform type breakdown. And if you look at the dark blue, you see that in 2016 to 2019, significant portions of hacks are actually coming from centralized service uh, vulnerabilities. So these are like your bank, like a centralized service, like a Coinbase, uh, Coinbase or Kraken that you don't really have much control over, right? These are not self-custodied platforms. Those had huge hacks. And then we saw kind of a correction in 2021. It seems like either the bad platforms just died or the new platforms and the current platforms figured their security out. So we saw a huge drop there. Most of the hacks then came from DeFi issues uh, and then token and private issues. Uh, and then we're starting to see kind of fluctuation as the years go by. So this is an interesting one for me to look at. This breakdown is the types of hacks and scams that are coming through. And the things I want to point out are compromised private keys. So the dark blue on this right hand side, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, you probably can't. Uh, but it's um, private key compromised. So this could be your iCloud getting hacked into. This could be someone finding your private key. This could even be your private key from the wallet being exposed because the wallet itself, the tech there wasn't strong enough. So all kinds of reasons. You're also seeing smart contract exploitation on the bottom, that light blue color. And phishing is a really small sliver there. And I want you to note how small it is in the big pie. But when it comes to actual number of how much gets uh, stolen per phishing scam. You can see on the very right hand side, it's a really small amount because these are typically individual users like you and me. Maybe it's a thousand here, a thousand there, which to us, at least to me, it feels like a lot. 
if you're going to get hacked for $1,000. But compared to some of the bigger hacks and scams, for example, 50 million on a platform the other day, it's a very small amount. But the number of phishing hacks, it's daily and it's a lot, the, the actual number of hacks themselves. And so we have to remember that even though it looks like a small piece of the pie, it's actually significantly impactful and it's impacting more volume of people. The number of people that it hits is really critical. Which brings us to the bulk of the presentation that I want to talk about is actual, actual actionable insights for consumer safety. So if you're listening to this, I'm expecting that you either have a wallet or you want to get a wallet or you're interested in self, self some kind of Web3 consumer usage which means that you have some responsibility to keep yourself safe in crypto. So we're going to go through how you could potentially do that. So user journey to crypto, all kinds of different paths into the space. I try to distill it to something general. The introduction piece is that somehow you are introduced to crypto, whether it be hearing it through a friend or buying some on Robinhood, or you hear about a new social network that you can get onto and earn tokens for free. Whatever it may be, you have that intro. Then you move on to the exploratory phase. You get a wallet or you sign up for a platform, you start to interact on social networks or you get an ENS, all of these different potential paths for exploration. And you're, you're going out, you're having fun, you're learning, you're earning all of the great things that Web3 provides and why there's so many people using it today. Unfortunately, there is that moment, this attack vector piece for pretty much everyone at this point where you either have a scare, you accidentally click on a link, you sign something that was malicious, you send something to an address that was incorrect. Across the board, there's all of these uh, user experience issues that cause uh, a little bit of a negative feeling within the crypto space for a user in their journey. Obviously, companies like Webacy and others are working on improving that, but for now, that's a vector that we know exists, and there's two outcomes. If either you leave. I know a lot of people who unfortunately got wrecked in crypto or had a bad experience and just decided to quit. Or you educate yourself and you improve your systems and then stay in this space for a long term. Ideally, at WebSC, one of our goals is to get everyone, first of all, to never hit that attack vector, right? That's long term, but that'll take time. We want to educate and we want to help people have the tools, at least, to stay safe in Web3. And the best thing you can do as an ecosystem is to make sure that people don't have that exit opportunity. Uh, we want to keep everyone here and understand the benefits of what Web3 has to offer. So talking to potential consumer attack vectors, there's not, there, it's not limited to these four here, but I've just listed the ones that I personally see the most frequently and the ones that are top of mind for me. Obviously, seed phrases. This is this most archaic piece of blockchain technology, in my opinion, is the seed phrase. It's the 12 to 24 word phrase that keeps your assets safe. It's a double-edged sword because it's secure, but then how do you actually manage it? Because if you lose it, you can't get access to your own assets. But if you store it somewhere convenient, it's also convenient for hackers, right? And so that's one big issue for seed phrases and also for businesses to protect that seed phrase as well. The second one, signatures and approvals. This is a large category and probably my trickiest piece, probably also the most important. How do you know what you're signing? Because as a user, for the most part, number one, maybe you don't read the code or you don't want to. And number two, it's actually kind of hard to navigate where is the code, what do you want to look for, and how do you make it human readable. And signatures and approvals are one of the biggest ways you can get your wallet drained, get your assets hacked, and so on. So a big category there. Then you have phishing. And this is actually a traditional Web2 hack and security vector as well. This just happens in regular uh, in internet. But maybe you get a DM on Twitter or DM on uh, Discord or wherever you might be hanging out in Web3, you click it, maybe you accidentally sign something or maybe you trust it and give approvals to something else and suddenly all your things are gone. So phishing is another big one. This is kind of that social aspect, um, if I want to mention that. And then finally, platform. And this one's the trickiest as a user is you have to trust the platform that you're using. So whether it be the wallet that you're hosting, that your assets on, or maybe it's the DAP that you're connecting to, how do you know what you're using is safe? That's a really, really big one uh, to manage. So when it comes to actionable insights, this is probably the, the biggest slide of things you can actually do. So for seed phrases, there are options on the market to etch your seed phrase into physical metal cards that won't erode over time. Some people do that. I think Ledger sells a version of it. There's versions of it on Amazon. 
I think we're starting to see the seed phrase actually be abstracted away because people realize that it's just not something that users and consumers want to do. I do believe that true blockchain enthusiasts and blockchain hardcore uh, people will continue to manage their own seed phrases truly. I still manage mine. But we do see other options on the market if you don't want to deal with a physical seed phrase or an actual seed phrase management system for yourself. So this would be wallets that don't require you to see the seed phrase or some sort of seed phrase management system that you don't have to manage. For signatures and approvals, wallets are improving to at least help you understand if the transaction you're about to execute is malicious to you or not. So for example, Phantom Wallet does a really good job of showing you hey, what's going to change in this transaction? And you can visually see if that's what you are trying to do or not. There's some other wallets like MetaMask are trying to integrate pre-transaction simulation protocols to mixed reviews, uh, but we are seeing changes in the systems themselves. Uh, there's other ways to also assess prior to signing. So you could look at the counterparty. Where are you sending money to? Who are you interacting with? What is the smart contract and has it been interacted with before? This requires a lot of your own research and the tools are limited. So that's another reason why WebSC is building these tools for users to improve that space as well. When it comes to phishing, I can just tell you what I do. On Discord, I turn off my DMs. If someone needs to reach me, they're going to either reach me through public channels in the public Discord channel, or they can reach me some other method. Um, I also try to not click on any links in Twitter. The, the general methodology of not clicking links in Web3 is not realistic, because if we were not supposed to click links, the entire internet experience wouldn't really function. So clicking links is not something that you should shy away from. But in general, before you click something, you should look at who is sending me this information. Does the link URL look correct? And if you're trying to access a specific website that you know, like Uniswap or Coinbase, maybe just bookmark the place that you've been before and that you know is trusted so that you can go there directly rather than having to go through a link. That's what I personally like to do. Then when it comes to platform, the trickiest of all, my only recommendation here that is realistic to follow is don't be the first one to try something new. So give it a couple days if it's a brand new shit coin. I don't know if I'm allowed to swear on here, excuse me. If it's a new meme coin, give it a few days. Uh, or if you're looking at a new platform that you want to trade on and connect your wallet to, try to find some reviews, look at their Twitter. Do they have real engagement or is it farmed bot engagement? There's a lot of different nuanced items that you can do to sleuth on chain whether something is safe or not. In general, if it's risky, I personally try to hesitate from interacting with it. That's just my risk profile. But at the end of the day, if you truly want to just be a DGEN and go and click everything, what I do recommend is having a DGEN wallet or a hot wallet that you can click to your heart's desire to. So I, I do have a wallet like that where I just play around and experiment. And if that gets hacked, it's fine because there's nothing in there. Uh, so that's one active recommendation I can give. I do want to do a quick, uh, not a test, but a uh, example with you all, if you're following along. So for example, this is which is Tensor's official Twitter and AirDrop website. So I'm showing three different categories here of screenshots of Twitters from a Tensor account. And our goal is to pick which one's the real one. Here's A, you can look at what's written here. You can look at the image, take a look at how many views it's had, comments and likes, who's posting it. Give you a second. Here's B. You can look at the, you know, the bio, what kind of check marks are next to it. Let's look at the heading. What about the viewer count? And C, who posted this one? Also viewer count. Let's look at what kind of hashtags and dollar signs are put here. And if I go back to this slide to show, I'll give you one second to decide. And it is B. So B, the middle one, this is the official Tensor site. How do you know? Uh, there's a couple ways to tell. So first, the the reach is actually quite large. You can see a lot of um, native actual interaction with this. And then also the gold check mark. Now, this is not always a surefire signal that something is safe. Uh, it costs, like, you know, teams can pay to have the gold check mark, uh, but it is a good signal in general. It's a high signal that it's probably going to be valid. And then that square box, uh, typically companies will have that and have people associated with this account. So if you want to click into that, you can see what accounts are associated with it. And if you see legitimate users associated with that account, you can pretty much verify that that account is going to be the company you're looking for. Now moving ahead, one more example. What's the correct Solana contract address for the wormhole token? So this one requires you, if you're following along, to go and actually find the wormhole token and try to find the contract address. 
again, crypto has been around for 10 plus years and this I still found kind of difficult. Like, where do you go? How do you find it? Where do you even find the wormhole token? How do you know which one's the right contract address? So I'll give you a moment to look. Three, two, one. It's C. So I'll go back to this previous one. A couple hidden items here, if you're not um, a crypto native, is that I said Solana contract address. Well, out of all three of these, only C is the Solana contract address. So even if you were not looking things up on the side, context clues, kind of the rem reminiscent of the ACT and the SAT, if you remember taking those. But overall, the, the method I used for doing this was I went to Twitter, I searched wormhole, I copied one of the addresses I found and looked through there, and I found that that was not the way to go. <laughs> so that was, a, that was a mistake on my end. And then I went to one of the public um, DeFi sites and typed in wormhole. The first one that came up happened to be the actual wormhole token, but I clicked on the first one, copied the, um, the address, went to Etherscan, found that it was verified, and saw all the transactions on it. So that's how I personally verified it. Again, not the best way to research, uh, but WebSea is actually working on ways to improve that. All right, to recap, this is a laundry list of common recommendations from people that are given when you talk about how can I stay safe in crypto. If you just look at this, it makes me rub my head too. And even though I'm in the space, I've been in the space for years, I try to follow all of these things, it does seem kind of overwhelming. And so at WebSC, we are working on fixing that. Our platform is consumer facing. We have a suite of services for you to do to do things like analyze risk, assess tokens that you're interacting with, watch your wallet so you can actually set up monitoring and real-time notifications on any wallet activity that happens to go in, out, and around your wallet so you have a watchful eye even when you're away from your computer. You have backup options, panic evac evacuation options, inheritance options. It's truly a self-custodial suite for you to be able to help yourself. On the other end, we actually integrate into wallets and dApps and other companies as well to help with that point of platform. How do you know that a platform is safe? So now it's not just you, but also us helping you assess the platforms that you're looking at. To sum it up, we enable a safer Web3 world through a consumer direct safety suite and embeddable APIs. That's what we do at Webacy. Now, briefly, to go through some of the business attack vectors, some of you may be starting your own companies or working at some or be interested in it. I'm going to go through this one quickly because I know we're coming up on time, but there's smart contract risks. So which you have audits, you have code reviews and so on. You try to build with best safety practices. You also have to think about malicious users. If you have a DeFi platform, the users that are coming into your platforms could be trying to maliciously manipulate the markets on your smart contracts to drain you. So you have to think about who are we letting onto the platform? And also from a regulatory perspective, are we allowed to have these users on the platform? Compliance and regulation is another one. It's different in every jurisdiction you go to, but as these become more clear, is your platform compliant? You don't want it to happen where you build an amazing platform and then you're not following the local regulations and you get shut down. That's the worst case scenario. And then general security. You're not just building for Web3 security. We have to think about things like DDoS attacks and other forms of uh, attack vectors that are potentially there because you're just building on the internet in general. That's traditional Web2 security. So in my ideal world, I like to think about the perfect world I want to live in and then how do we get there after that? In terms of wallets, I want my wallet to protect me from what I'm doing. I want to be able to trust my wallet, first of all, to hold my assets safely, but it should help me out in understanding where am I sending money? What kind of transaction am I doing? Are the assets in my wallet safe? There's so many situations that I've heard of where a token shown in a user's wallet was sent into them. They were curious, they clicked on it, they traded it, and someone got drained. The hacks are becoming super sophisticated and the tools to service these users and these hacks also need to become as sophisticated, if not more, to prevent them in the first place. When it comes to DeFi, token safety, there's a new token every minute, and every second at this point. So DeFi platforms need to improve how to filter out malicious tokens that are straight up bad to users. But then there's also this balance of allowing people to do whatever they want to do, but still keeping them safe. So in my opinion, tokens that are going to drain you or smart contracts and transactions that will drain you should not be allowed. But if someone wants to buy a meme coin to speculate on price action, who's to say the, whether they can or they can't, right? There's this debate about freedom and security uh, kind of on a spectrum. So DeFi platforms need to really design what kind of platform they want to provide for their users. But I also think they have a responsibility to, at a baseline, keep their users and their platform safe. Finally, same thing with dApps. 
As a DAP, as a user on a DAP, you're trusting that the systems are fair. Oftentimes a Sybil, bots, AI, it's not always fair, even traditional web, web too. So these DAPs have a responsibility to, again, keep their platform safe, keep their systems fair, and keep their users safe on the end. Now, the concept of embedded security, which was the title of this all, was how do we actually embed security systems and security integration layers inside of the platforms that we're using? So this would be, for example, addressing address risk during the process of the actual transaction itself, or even prior. Understanding exposure risk, if the wallet is safe or not that you're using. If you're holding all of your big important assets on a wallet that has an open approval to a drainer, that is a no-go in my book, and you want to be able to know that, right? So exposure risk is something that is active and changing as your behavior changes. So we want to be able to follow and know that. And then finally, smart contract analysis, not just prior to you minting or for the platforms that have smart contracts to know, but it's also has to be a regular analysis. For now, projects, usually they get an audit when the smart contracts are ready to be audited. And then they think they're good for a while until the, until, until the smart contracts change again. But there's a lot that happens between audits that we need to be conscious of. And a lot of the times the exploits do come either after the audit or sometime after a change was made that was not audited after the initial audit. So it's a lot to consider when it comes to embedded security and safety in the space. All right, if you made it this far with me, thank you. Got some homework for you, which I know we all love. Uh, all of these things, you can sc screenshot it later, are things you can do today right now in front of your computer to make sure that your safety goes up a little bit. This includes looking at your wallet hygiene, are your, safe, are your big assets in a safe cold storage wallet? Do you have a separate hot wallet? I would love if you could practice a few rounds of research, both on Twitter, on Etherscan, wherever you explore Web3. Check it out and see if you're able to quickly navigate, especially if you want to do something fast. I recommend bookmarking your favorite websites. I do this through my, my bar. You can make a folder, whatever system works for you. Big, big, big one. We've seen so many uh, SMS 2FA get exploited in the past year that if you have your phone or your phone number as your SMS option, change it if there is an option to. You should at least change it to the Authenticator app on your phone. There's a Microsoft Authenticator or a Google Authenticator that works well. Or a physical device like a YubiKey, just change it off your... Uh, SMS, if at all possible, because we've seen way too many issues uh, this year, past year, and, and we're probably going to continue to see more. And then finally, explore some of the offerings in the space when it comes to Web3 security. Seriously, it's it's the whole landscape has changed in the past two years. The, the amount of tools and services to help users have grown exponentially. WebSC is one of them, uh, but there's a bunch of other ones on the market too that I can highly recommend. Uh, so please use them uh, so that all of the things that I've talked about um, are things that are supported when it comes to your own safety in Web3. And finally, a little show is to use WebSC. We're building for users in the space. We want to keep you safe. I personally use all of our own products and it's kept me safe so far. All right, I'll stop there. Amazing. That was so informative. Um, I have a lot of questions for you. Um, but of course, if anyone listening to this has any questions, drop them in our Discord or under the YouTube and we can get you answers asynchronously. So Micah, I feel like you dropped so much information. I also have... It took me like being uh, basically scammed, right? To understand certain things like turn off your DMs in Discord and like why you would do something like that or how people really like... I love the examples that you showed with a Tensor Foundation because there's so many of these... Um, I don't even know what, what they're called, like catfishing kind of accounts, right? Where they change the username just slightly and then they basically make it such that you think you're engaging with the correct entity, but it's really just some scam that's going to drain your account. So thanks for going through these examples. I think, you know, there's <laughs> so much defensive work you have to do in crypto that it's great to see Webacy be a resource that consumers can use. So I, we didn't really cover this, but what is really the, the business model of Webacy? Is it a um, sort of monitoring subscription or how does how does it work for consumers? So on the consumer side, you can think of WebSC kind of like a Norton. Do you know Norton antivirus? And it does things a lot. It does a lot of things for you that you're actually not aware of. 
but it helps you monitor your systems. It helps you analyze your systems for malware or something, some bugs on your system if you have any. It also helps you act if there is anything for you to do. So WebSC is very similar. We help you analyze your wallet. We look at your open approvals. We look at your behavioral history. We look at the assets in your wallet to tell you if there are any that you maybe shouldn't touch or if there's behavioral activity that we think, hey, you might actually want to change the way you do this because it could get you drained in the future, for example. We also do monitoring. Like I mentioned, you can actually set up real-time alerts based on activity. This is my favorite feature because when I'm away on a run or at a conference, I get pinged if something happens in my wallet. And that feels really good that something's watching out for me as long as it's not like a drain or something's leaving my wallet. But then at least I know. Um, so yeah, it's, it's very comparable to like a Norton type of thing, but it's a full security suite for you to set up all kinds of different safety services for yourself. Got it. And so can you maybe give us a sense of how many hacks or security breaches WebSC may have prevented for users since you've existed? I don't know if it's possible to measure that, but we'd love to get a sense of um, uh, some of the preventative work you've done. Yeah, I mean, since inception, I don't know that number, but we have stories coming in basically every day from users saying that, hey, I analyzed my wallet and I found something like an open approval that I didn't even know was on my wallet before. Right. And I love hearing these stories because those are things that could have affected people tomorrow or next week or even just hearing from people, hey, I analyzed my wallet. It was actually high risk. And so what I did was sent all my important assets to a, a cold storage wallet and I changed up the game. So those assets are all now safe. Right. So from a preventative piece, I think we've done exceptional work. What is also great to hear is when people mention Wallet Watch on Twitter, we see it all the time. People will post, hey, I got a notification that I got my airdrop rewards mm -hmm. or I got a notification that my assets bridged to Arbitrum and now I can actually continue my work on Arbitrum because that could take 10 to 20 minutes depending on how congested things are. Uh, it just changes the way that we navigate Web3 and I'm super happy to hear those day-to-day -day stories. Yeah. And you mentioned you are also working with enterprises, right? And so how much of um, Web3 security do you think it's like working with enterprises to almost like embed this type of UI um, in a lot of their products or their contracts versus like the consumer themselves having to take this sort of action? Or do you think it's always going to be a blend of the two? Most people know WebSea as a consumer app. Uh, I think we've done a good job of building that brand and that trust recognition among users. Uh, but ultimately, I do think the, the biggest impact we're going to have in actually affecting end users is going to be through those integrations. Because like you mentioned, it took you until you got hacked to actually think about user safety, right? right. And that's the same case with everybody. Typically, you're not even going to think about it until you have a scare or you actually get hacked. And that's just humanity. We know this. Um, user security is not the biggest category when it comes to things you think about when you wake up out of bed. I'm probably the only one that thinks about it. And so when it comes to integrations, yeah, the, the partners that we have today, we're already seeing millions of calls of wallets connected, things analyzed coming through our servers from these partners already. So just through distribution, that's huge. And also impact. If we're able to take one drainer contract off of a DAP platform for minting, we just saved all of their users from clicking on it. Uh, and so I think longer term, that's going to be a larger distribution method. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. I think, um, uh, I mean, it follows a lot of the paradigms of how businesses usually sort of go in terms of reaching users. Um, because if you embed in one platform, again, your reach is like all of their users who engage with them versus like an individual choosing to engage on their own safety. Mm -hmm. um, but you mentioned there's, you know, a, a ton of security solutions now out there. Um, what does that market look like today? And um, who are some of the other players that you think people should check out? Yeah, when it comes to consumer, so we're, we're seeing a lot of excellent um, browser extensions, if you've used those before. So you could download, let's say, a Pocket Universe or a Wallet Guard. Those two teams are really incredible, so I can recommend that. And this one pops up prior to a transaction. So if you're about to transact, uh, it'll come up, it'll show you if they think it's safe or not, and then you can decide on your own if you want to proceed. So that's a really good consumer one. Uh, I don't see too many other companies doing what we do, so the monitoring, the analysis, and so on. Um, but also, like I mentioned, the Phantom has a really great built-in uh, transaction simulation feature. I know MetaMask has something similar as well. And these wallets are just improving uh, the actual UI too. 
I think that's what we're also going to start to see is that Rather than security being something that you actively have to go to, it's going to be in the platforms that you're using and the wallets that you have. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I haven't, I've seen some of the the phantom ones pop up where it'll say, this is a malicious um, website, don't engage with it. So it's really great to see some of the wallets doing um, their job as well on this front. Yeah, for sure. Um, cool. So maybe one last question and we can move to the recap. But um, in terms of onboarding, right? I think like we talked about onboarding new users is always a question in crypto. And especially for something that is much more like preventative, the idea of safety, um, it probably takes someone getting hacked in order to feel like, oh, I really need to invest in this type of a solution for myself. So how do you think about um, the initial like setup and um, getting users onboarded to Webacy? And how do you, I guess, attract this next wave of users to really focus on um, safety for themselves? Yeah, that's a that's a really good topic because I think there is a category of people who are natively a little more a little bit more risk averse. So they are thinking about security as part of it, which is great. I love meeting these people because they just come straight to us. They know what they want, they get it. But when it comes to new users, especially ones that are more, I think in the next few months we're gonna see a lot of more traditional retail type users coming into the space that are not crypto native and are new to explore. So I think part of it's really going to be uh, getting people into the habit of being safe and doing those checks. Just like you're trained to lock the door, maybe as a kid, or maybe you're you're told to put on a helmet, eventually it sticks, right? So as many touch points as we can get. For us, users usually come to us for Wallet Watch, that monitoring service, and then they get used to seeing messages from us about their safety, how risky was that transaction they just made, right? And they get into the habit of looking at it and researching and analyzing what they just did on chain or they come to us from the risk analysis. And that's even better because they're actually they're actively looking at what they just did. Um, and so that piece, especially if there's a red flag moment for them, even if it didn't drain them, it could prevent something in the future. So for me, I think it's a lot about touch points, but again, it's going to be wherever they onboard, whether it's GameFi, DeFi, a wallet, those companies have a huge responsibility to educate their users from the get go. Uh, we're, we're trying to get them to understand that many of them do, uh, but some of them don't. So we, we got to make sure they're on it. Yeah, I need to check out um, while I watch for myself. I feel like um, I have a thesis or like a hypothesis that my, maybe my wallet might be kind of risky, but we'll see. I'll, I'll, I'll let you know after this call. I'll let you know. <laughs> um, okay, uh, so I think we're going to now move to the the wrap up. Um, as we conclude, I think uh, one thing we always ask our speakers to do is sort of share your final thoughts or guidance for our community. Again, it's uh, people who either are pretty early in their crypto journey or uh, more of like university type students. So we we'll love um, any advice you might have, uh, either about crypto or generically about um, either, you know, how they can contribute to Webacy or just some life advice as parting words. Yeah, I think I will share the reason I am so invested in blockchain. And that is because of the vision I feel like blockchain can create for us. Uh, and the reason I am was interested in blockchain in the first place. And so a piece of that was how I mentioned in the very beginning of our call, um, I feel like blockchain technology has the opportunity to change a lot of the systems that are messed up right now. So to give you an example, uh, I had traveled a lot growing up. And so when it comes to proving identity and where I live from an address perspective, I have a really hard time doing that. Mm -hmm. Even though I'm a, I'm a good citizen, I pay my taxes, I live in a place right now, it is really hard to figure out and prove to, let's say, the DMV or anywhere that needs to know where I lived, that I live where I'm living or I have lived where I am in the past. Imagine if we had blockchain history of our addresses, we wouldn't even need to bring my like uh, Wi-Fi bill to the DMV to prove that I live at an address. It's so archaic, the world we live in now. So that's just one small example. But then I think of an example, like maybe the person listening doesn't care about their identity, be, uh, their address because they've lived at the same place. What about coffee that you drink every day? Uh, I'm also in the coffee scene. If you think about the supply chain of coffee, 
so much of the value is not going back to farmers, for example, that actually make the coffee. But what if you could track where the coffee came from? And what if you could actually extract pieces of that to get, send it back to the farmers the way that royalties come from NFTs back to the, uh, the original creator, right? So whatever system you think of can be improved through blockchain. So that's why I get so excited. Uh, so I guess my, my message to people is that if there's a system that you want to improve, uh, do it. Because right now we're, it's the open wild west to actually build that future that you want. Blockchain is the perfect place to do it. Uh, and there, there's no other time. That's why I'm building Wabasi. That's why so many people are building on chain. Yeah. And I, um, I remember you mentioned you studied uh, games or game theory where there is um, information asymmetry. Mm -hmm. And I feel like in some ways, um, crypto is a good game field for that, right? Because there is a lot of information asymmetry. And like you said, we're so early that you have... Um, outsize influence on where this future could go. Um, yeah, I'm also curious, like, do you still do anything with Cirque? Or I remember you said you like playing poker and things like that, too. So like, how do you find time to do all these things outside of being a founder? I have a lot of hobbies. Uh, I also have this thesis that if you're, especially if you're a founder, you're so in it every day. Like I, I work all the time, um, but I find that you find inspiration in places you don't expect. So I do try to put myself in places like poker games. Um, and that actually has a surprisingly high ROI on people you meet in the space, but also ideas that you have and concepts that you can kind of play around with that you're, that are just sitting in your head. Um, so that's why I make time for it. Uh, but yeah, I don't, work for Cirque du Soleil anymore. I still train uh, in a similar type of fashion, but definitely not at the intensity I used to. Um, but I think you, you play poker as well, but poker yeah. is what I make time for. I for love sure. poker. I think it's um, so fascinating. We'll have to talk more about where you play. Yes, for sure. Cool. Well, um, we're going to close this session. So thank you so much again for being here. Um, as always, the way that our workshops work, we will recap this session via our newsletter. We'll send it out um, on Wednesdays. And you can keep an eye out on our comms for um, the newsletter as well as our blog. So every um, workshop that we do, we will write a corresponding blog uh, about the topic, which will go a bit deeper and um, more succinctly on the topic we discuss in our workshop. Um, and so keep an eye out on our Twitter um, as well as Discord for these um, content pieces and their release schedule. Um, but thank you all for tuning in and we will see you next time for another workshop. Cool. Thank you, Michael, for being here. Thank you. Thank you.